Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, it turns out that I can't see what's coming up in my slide deck until I click the button. So you might be as surprised as I am for what the next slide is. You know, um, when Marion asked me to take a slot on this agenda and have a chance to speak with you all, um, you know, I kind of cranked out my traditional, you know, image-rich presentation. And being a marketing guy who got really excited about data one day, uh, most of my presentations involve lots and lots of pictures. Um, but I thought, actually, the identity question was a really, really intriguing one and something that I wanted to explore for myself in terms of the, the lens through which I was going to speak today. And so I took it all, threw it all away. Sorry, Miriam. Threw it all away over the weekend and wrote a completely new presentation, uh, which Miriam hasn't seen. So we'll see how we go. Um, I always have a disclaimer in all my presentations. Uh, all the pictures were stolen from Google. The words are my own, but there was no data involved or injured or manipulated in the making of this presentation. In the beginning, there is nothing. The end. No. In the beginning, there is nothing, right? There is no data about us. There is no identity. None of it exists. And then one day, one fine spring morning, boom, we arrive and we're born. Well, hopefully, that's what happened to people in this room. And I thought to myself, that's actually quite interesting, isn't it? Because the first thing that happens often is you get a name, a date. I can see some of it. You know, who your mother is, who your father is, where you were born, what gender you are, and potentially even your ethnicity. And it made me think about this for us in terms of the construct of identity because I was assigned all of those attributes, right? I mean, I don't have any role in any of that. None of you did, unless you changed your name by deed poll or so much, some such arch method. method. But I'm, I don't have any control over these things. They just occurred for me. So I thought it was really interesting was that I spent my whole life defining myself by a whole bunch of attributes that were latched onto me outside of my control, because that's who I am. But then I thought, well, actually, it's only part of who I am, right? And I'm not an expert on identity, by the way. I just thought I'd share my experience with you in the process. And I thought, if I don't really have any control over any of the attributes that are associated with me, do I own any of them? I'm just going to do a little quick test. Is there anyone in the audience whose name is Stephen? A couple, including myself. So I thought, you know, first of all, I can't really own that. So that's kind of an interesting thought. I don't really own the date I was born or the place I was born at. I've got three brothers, so my parents aren't unique either. Uh, the location was somewhat used by plenty of other people in Papakura at the time. Uh, and so forth. And I kind of thought, well, in that construct, all of those attributes are things that are ascribed to me, aren't things that I really own. Which kind of made me think a little bit further about it. And I kind of landed on this one thought, which is the first question to kind of put away in our minds today is, of all those attributes, do I own any of them or none of them? Because I really think that the equation sits on either one or the other extreme. I can't think it sits in the middle, right? You either do all of them or you do none of them. I don't think you can have a middle ground in that regard. So it's just a thought. But then I thought, you know, given the work we did with the New Zealand Data Futures Forum, one of the things we stumbled across, one of the things that we considered was that if we don't own any of this stuff, data in general, but let's just stick with identity data for a second, then what rights do I have? And I think what Sandy was talking about is really, really important and actually quite powerful in this construct because it's all rights driven. It's not ownership based. So in terms of my identity, I have rights to aspects of it. I have the right to use my name, obviously. I have the right to provide that data to people who are interested in it, at my discretion. There are government organizations and agencies who have right to access that identity profile of me for the fulfillment of services. Whether or not I've given them consent to do that or not is a completely different question, which I'm not even going to open up. But it just seems to create a really interesting foundation for a question. Because given I don't have any uniqueness in any of that, just for the sake of an argument. I don't have any uniqueness in it. I don't own any of it because it's shared and it's common, it's used by other people too. Then actually the rights around that also become questionable. Like what rights are there? You know, 
And I think one of the things we tabled as a, in one of our papers from the De Data Futures Forum was the question of ownership versus rights of any data, including our identity itself. So therefore, the conclusion of my first part of the presentation today was going to be, I am an identity as defined by a bunch of descriptors that are attached to me on the day I was born. And therefore, I am an identity by description. It doesn't say anything about me. The fact that I like triangled socks, for example. I like occasionally wear pink shirts, but that's only because my daughter chose this one. But it doesn't tell you any of that information, right? It just says, here's an identity by description. And I find that kind of interesting, because I've probably like many people in this room, I have multiple passports from different countries I've lived in over the world. And all of them have all the same data points in them. And it kind of made me think about, you know, in Canada and the UK and New Zealand, I'm described in all of those systems by the same set of data. But am I actually seen in those systems as the same individual? And what I mean by that is the data that I was attributed to me when I was born in New Zealand is used in a certain way in New Zealand. The data that was ascribed to me when I got my passport in the UK, I wonder if that's used in the same way or not. I wonder if my identity in Britain is the same as my identity in New Zealand, even though it has the same attributes associated with it, even though I don't own any of them, which I thought was an interesting thought process. So therefore, question, description equals me. Does it? Does the description, name, date of birth, location, parents, gender, ethnicity, etc., equal who I am? So I can tell you now that in the world of marketing, that's completely irrelevant. No one really cares. Sorry to burst your bubbles. Sorry. We don't. Because actually, description as me is one. It's very, very, very inefficient to market and the mass population to one. It's highly cost inefficient. Although data's gonna change that and direct, ma direct marketing will change that too over time. Time for a pause. There are several blank slides in here. When we find them, and we're on this journey together, remember, um, it means that there's gonna be a change in the conversation. First bit, description is me. Second bit, in the beginning, there was nothing. And then we did some stuff. These are highly technical words. It's a highly complex presentation. So we did some stuff, right? Went to school, fell over on my bike, broke my arm. Broke my arm. Actually, in the space of one year, uh, my, both my, my, two of my brothers and I went to horse riding, mountain biking, and all sorts of stuff. It wasn't called that then. I think it was called BMX biking then. Um, in the space of one year, we actually ended up in A&E almost every alternative weekend for a year with you know, horse riding injuries and concussions and other bits and pieces. I wonder what the, I wonder what the uh, MSD data tells them about me uh, or my family. Anyway, um, so stuff happens. Sorry, first of all, we do some stuff. You know, we do go to school and blah, blah, blah. And then events happen too, right? I mean, it's not just that you go out and choose to do things, things happen to us. You know, were you in that plane when the front wheel broke off it or whatever, you know? Uh, were, you happened, were you in, uh, actually I'll tell you something that happened to me, which is kind of a strange segue. Uh, I put my back out, don't ask me what I was doing, injured my back. Wellington Hospital, full of drugs, so they could, straight, they could straighten me out on a stretcher to take an x-ray of my back. And the fire alarm went off, and they evacuated me in a beautiful little skirt thing face down on a table <laughs> in the main road. Was it Newton Road, is that what it's called, in Wellington here? Uh, and uh, there was a photo on the front page of the minion of my butt. <laughs> so that was an event. It happened to me. So not only am I out there doing stuff, there are events that happen to me too. And then there is some weird stuff that we do to ourselves. We quantify things, right? We put stuff in our pockets, our phones, we start wearing Fitbits and wristwatches, and we start doing all that other stuff too. And we quantify ourselves, we quantify our lives. We quantify it in terms of the things we accumulate, the assets we have, the money we've got in the bank. 
And this is an interesting stretch for the term quantified, but it also includes the connections we make with friends who we hang out with. It's a considerable thought. How many people go out for dinner with friends and they all split the bill at the end? Did you, your bank, know that you do that? Right? It knows. It knows who your friends are. Because it knows who you split the bill with at the same restaurant at the same time. It's not rocket science. It's pretty simple. In fact, it will take my six-year-old about ten minutes to figure out how to do that with a spreadsheet and the right data set. It's pretty scary, right, in one dimension, but it's just normal behavior in the other. So we do stuff. Events happen to us, and we're also starting to quantify our lives. And all that happens in the real world. So don't forget for a second that it's not just digital, right? It's actually real-world behavior. When I ran a marathon, by the way, I've never run a marathon, that was a lie. When I ran a half marathon, uh, the event was recorded. I quantified myself, but the activity took place in the real world. But it also takes place in the digital world. And you would have heard Sandy talk a lot about that today already, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about digital data over the last couple of days. But it's real world and digital. And I keep thinking, but where I come from and the world I've lived in for a long time, there is really no distinction. It's just the world. It just seems to be parts of it are connected and parts of it aren't. But effectively, it's just the world, right? I mean, it's not, I don't know about you, but I don't sit, stand, step through some vortex. I'm currently in the digital universe. I'm now in the real world again. It doesn't really exist anymore in that dimension. So all the things that we do, the things that happen to us, the quantification that goes on around us, happens in both the real world and the digital world simultaneously, and they're all connected together. It's a fairly reasonable assumption, I would have thought. And the reason why that's interesting is because of all that stuff. Right? All of that leads to data, or data. Do we say data or data? Data? OK, data, data. Data sounds like that guy off Star Trek. Um, so data, right? It all leads to this stuff. It's about numbers. It's a numbers game. And I find this really interesting because through the lens of data is a measurement of who we are, not in the first instance, the data is a description of who we are, i.e. name, date of birth, gender, ethnicity, and so forth, are descriptions. This is a measure of who we are in terms of the way we're being and the way we're doing. Does that make sense? So everything we be, it sounds terrible English. My potential would be too upset with me. But it's terrible English, but it's true. The data, the events, the, the events, the stuff we do, the quantification of our lives are a reflection of who we are in the dimension of being. I am being this person. I have these relationships. I like these kind of choices. I have these kind of preferences. I have these friends. I go to these places. And the doing side of it, right, is also pretty interesting. I bought this. I sold that. I searched on trade me for these other things. And all that data in the universe has all come together. And it was like this. I call it data soup. But at this particular point, we're also still just talking about me. Just in case any of you guys are wondering whether this was about you, it's not. Although you could put yourself in my position up here and stand here and say it's also about me. But all of that's about me. It's a description of me, the official description of me. Then there's the identity of me based upon what I've been doing in the world. The identity of me based upon who I'm being in the world. And the identity of me as described, which is our official document. I remember a great conversation a few years ago, and the company I spoke to shall remain anonymous in case we've got lots of Twitter fanatics in the room. Uh, and they said, we actually don't need to know who the customer is anymore. We just have to look at their behavior to identify them. The, most, the least valuable piece of information we have about you is your name or where you live. Because we can figure that out pretty damn quickly. It's a process of elimination. And I was like, wow, that's pretty, pretty interesting. And he goes, how do you know that? He goes, oh, because we lost our customer record data set. <laughs> and 72 hours later, we'd reestablished it. Out of 780,000 customers, they only couldn't identify 10. 
I thought, that's extraordinary. It's also really powerful on one dimension, but incredibly terrifying on the other. But it kind of led me into this really interesting question about, back to the very beginning of my presentation, in the beginning there was nothing and I was born and all these things were ascribed to me and I walked my whole life looking after it and protecting it and I just found out it's the most useless piece of information that the company can have. What's more important to them is who I'm being and what I'm doing because that's a much more accurate reflection of what's actually going on in the world. Because I can't actually tell what my preferences are, or who I like, or who my friends are, simply by looking at a name. So I found that a really just interesting moment. And it's actually the reason why I rewrote my whole presentation, was that particular thought process was like, well, that's actually really cool. I wonder if anyone else has had that kind of epiphany as well. And if they haven't, I want to share it, because I want to hear what other people have to say about it, because I think it's interesting. I'm not saying we should go off and do anything, or change anything, or be drastic. I just think it's an interesting thought process to go through. Anyway, we're still talking about me. And then the, this great thing called the inferred me, which we in the, so how many market, do we have any marketers in the room? Wow, okay, so the inferred me in the marketing universe, right? And I mean, so I work for Laws New Zealand, some of you may know who we are. I run the Flybys program and Lab360, which is our data analytics business. And this thing called the inferred me is actually the inferred other people, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute which is this crazy construct that once we understand a certain set of behaviours lead to another set of behaviours, we go on the hunt for people that exhibit the behaviours. Because they're the easiest people to persuade or influence about the next action. But we're not looking for John Smith or Marjorie, because the description identity thing is irrelevant. It's just a group of people that behave like that. Does that make sense? It's like Sandy's image of the anonymized, you know, the whole anonymized data and the flu viruses and all that sort of stuff. It's a similar kind of construct, right? It's patterns of people, because we want to operate at a scale where it makes sense. You know, and we work out that there are minimums and maximums and the amount of volume and the dollars we can spend and all that return on investment stuff. It doesn't make sense below a certain threshold, so there's no point in looking below that. So although customers and human beings often feel a one-to-one -one experience when they interact with different businesses, it's not. It's an experience designed to interact with people that look like you. You just happen to be the person who's experiencing at that point in time. And we're getting really, really good at it. Really, really good at it. But no one's stealing any identity in all this stuff, right? It's simply a case of you just happen to match the profile of people that look like that. And therefore, we're going to give you an experience that we think is highly appropriate. And it's driven around that. So it makes you feel good as a consumer because you're feeling like you're getting a really good deal. And as a company, we feel very really good because we're driving value out of our relationship with our customers and there's not really anything kind of creepy going on behind the scenes. But inferred is really fascinating. Okay. In the beginning, so, uh, actually there was nothing. But this kind of leads me into this interesting thought process. If there's me, and this stuff's all about me, and you can infer other people from me, then what about everybody else? Because surely isn't that the next kind of logical line of inquiry is, what about all the other people? So in our little test, how many people put petrol in their car in the last week? Okay, cool. How many people used their FPOS card today? That's interesting. How many people own a smartphone? No one's admitting they don't. <laughs> interesting. How many people have children? Hmm. How many people live in Wellington? How many people live outside of New Zealand? Right, great. So here's a really interesting thought. The petrol, the FPOS card, living in New Zealand, living outside New Zealand, etc., are just slices of the world, right? Because all the people with their hands up who got petrol last week is a group of people that the petrol companies would have seen. It's just a slice. All, right. All the people who used their FPOS card this morning created two slices, well, actually three slices. There's the Paymark slice, because all the transactions traveled through the switch. There's the bank slice, because they would have only seen the transactions that related to them. And then there's the shop slice, the people that actually spent money at that shop. 
And the same goes for people who have got children, people who live in different countries, people who travel, what airline you do, all those are slices. So the interesting thing about the everybody else question is that there really isn't everybody else. Because every single one of us is fundamentally unique. And it just so happens that when we leave our little footprints in the sand, so to speak, in the data that around us when we activate and do things in our lives, is that from the outside looking in, the outside world looking in on us only sees a piece of it. Right? They only see all the people that did the same thing as you. So coming back to the inference thing that happened I was talking about previously, it's really complex, right? Because the fact that I filled my car up yesterday at a Z station in Smells Farm, and then got on a plane and flew to Wellington, those two events are uncorrelated. It's just impossible for Z, for example, picking on them, but to know that I got on a plane to go to Wellington. It's equally un impossible for Air New Zealand to know that I filled up my car with petrol, because they're just, the, they're just totally different events. But what I find fascinating is that we all are doing that. And so what the companies have in the world, or businesses or government departments have, is just their view of the world. And the only person who has an entire view of the world about all the things you have and haven't done is you. Because everyone else only has a part of it. And then, of course, another thought process popped into my little brain, which was, if that's, what everyone, if that's everybody else, what about everything else? Because if you recall, there's, things that you, there's stuff you've done, there's events that have happened to you, and there's the world in which you've quantified yourself, plus there's who you are from an identity as, a, as identity as described, and then we add into that mix everybody else, being we're all me's, all right, so hopefully you're sticking with me, because by the way, this is, I'm unleashing this on you right now. Um, the other side of that is everything else, which is all the non-people stuff that goes on in the world. And there's a lot of this. And in fact, I can't remember who mentioned it, I don't think it was Sandy, but I, I can't remember who the professor was in the, U, in the US, but they said that something like 90 to 95% of all the value from big data comes from this bit everything else, not from all the people. Because all the everything else stuff is environmental, environment, you know, managing the environment, um, managing traffic, reducing fuel costs, increasing efficiency, optimization of infrastructure, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. It all impacts us as human beings, but it's not necessarily about us. It's not driven knowing that I'm Stephen and I was born in this location, I have these parents, or this is what I do, this is what's happened to me, and this is how I measure myself. It's simply the world talking to itself and creating a world view. And then I thought, well, maybe this all lands us in this really weird term called usness, which by, also, by the way, this is a made up word. Don't look it up in the dictionary, it doesn't exist. <coughs> the usness of it all. And what I mean by that is, here we are, me, you, we're all being individuals, described as identity, behaving and doing certain things, leaving a trail in the universe of all the things we have done, happened to us, quantified about us. We've all aggregated that together, so that's everybody else, plus me. And we're all living in a hyper-connected universe of all the things around us that are actually nothing to do with us. And I thought, well, that's just us. That's just humanity to an extent, right? It's just society. And in fact, that hasn't really changed from that construct for maybe, I don't know, a couple of hundred years, maybe a bit longer, right? We still eat, drink, go to the bathroom, have children, <coughs> although soon I think we'll be able to grow them in a test tube. My wife thinks that's a great idea. You know, there's all, this, there's all this stuff that's changing around the world or in the world around us, but actually it's all about the usness of it. How helpful can it be? How do we feed people? How do we look after people? How do we become more environmentally friendly? How do we be more sustainable? But it's still driven by us, right? So in all of this, I've forgotten that was next. And all of this, it kind of leads me back to this really simple question. So if my identity, which I am so connected to, because I am, even though I said it's just a description of me, I'm still pretty connected to it. Because in the beginning I was born. And so the bit that you may have noticed has disappeared from the slide is the people. 
right? Because he only talked about people once, and it was at the very beginning on the well, third slide in, where was a photo of a baby. Everything else that has existed since that moment in this presentation is just data. It's not connected to anyone. It's just data. It just exists. It's all out there. And the essence of it, for me anyway, leads us right back to the very beginning, which is it's all really about people. It's all about people, even though it's not about people. Well, that's a horrible thing to say. I'm going to try that one again. It's all about people because at the very center of it all is me. My identity, as I describe it for myself, always labeled to me. What I do, what events occurred to me, the, um, th the things I do every day, the way I'm being every day, how I interact, da -da -da, it's all about me. And then it's connected to everybody else, and guess what? They're all about them because it's all about their view of the world. And all those things are connected together by everything else, which is the environment in which we live, and the world in which we occupy, the resources in which we consume. And that's really just about us. So maybe, just as a way of thinking, is identity is just simply a reflection of ourselves. Nothing more to it, which is why we're so anxious about it. And we're anxious about it individually and collectively, I think. We're anxious about what it can mean how it can be used, how it can be inferred, how we can be judged, how we can judge others. And I think it's because of that construct that we get a bit freaked out by it. And so when we set up the Data Futures Forum, Miriam was part of that team and we kicked it off, one of the things that we concluded after our many, many, felt like a long, long time, but it was weeks and months of thinking and talking and other bits and pieces, was that in that entire ecosystem around the identity piece and all the data that relates to me and you and everyone else in the system around it, then perhaps there are really only four very simple constructs on which we should build a foundation for a data-driven future where data is really all about us. And the first question there is where is the value in all of that? Who has the right to the value? Who owns it? Where does it go? Interestingly enough, to Sandy's point, who is creating value from your data? And how are you creating value from it too? Or are you? So value is the primary consideration here before we get anything else. Because if there's no value, this may come as a shock to people, if there is no value, nobody will do it. Right, and I don't mean value in this through the economic sense because value is also social and environmental and also can be measured in things like emotional state and psychological state, behavioral state and so forth. But if there is no value for you or someone else, people just won't do it. It's the fundamental driver of most action, right? Something has to come off it or you wouldn't do it in the first place. Even if you said you send your kids to school so that you can get some time out as opposed to them learning something, there's still value in that. So the action is linked to value. So we must understand the value first. I'm going to go around this in clockwise. Trust. There must be trust in the system, whatever the system is. Interesting consideration from Sandy about the uh, what do they call it? Personal data store? Is that, what he, is that what he called it? You know, the idea that you can control your data and share it with people, and there's a few great questions around that. Uh, that's a really interesting construct in itself, because who would you trust to create that? You know, and what kind of trust exists in it? Thirdly, how do we create an environment that's fully inclusive? Now, here, going back to the very, very beginning of the presentation, identity as described, plus identity as doing or being, plus everybody else's identity, and the world around us, it's pretty inclusive. It has to be all encompassing. It has to be. The system and the foundation on which we build the stuff has to be inclusive. Because there's no room for discrimination. It can't be. Although there is always a risk of discrimination when you bring new information to light. And the last one here is control. And I think this is really, really, really important. I might say that again, it's really, really, really important, control. Because control is the vehicle, in my opinion, that helps you gain trust. Control is also the mechanic through which you can turn on and off value. When I think about this from a business context, from someone like Loyalty NZ and Flybys as an example, 
The value exists in the eyes of the consumer only. If we're not doing the right things to create the right value construct, they have the ultimate control. <laughs> they just stop doing it. Turn it off, walk away, ring up the call center. I'd like you to take a look, delete all my data and stop accessing all my information so we can't, you can't target me anymore. But just as a sign of segue there, that is the number one call to our call center these days is, you know so much about me, why do you send me the stuff that's irrelevant? Which astounds me, because we do that on purpose. <laughs> right? We actually don't want to make it that precise, because it's actually quite a lot of, lot of, it's actually a lot more fun in life, be a little bit of serendipity and a little bit of surprise. Because if you make it really, really precise, it gets pretty boring pretty quickly. But back to the slide, sorry. Control. Control must exist. Control over who has access to it, what it's used for, how it's deployed. And if you go back to the start of the slide, in the beginning there was nothing, and then I was born, and all these attributes were, def were attached to me. I'm now identity as described. Who has control over that? Question to mull over lunch. Who has control over that? I certainly don't, right? Because I can't change the day I was born or who my parents were. I was about to say I couldn't change my gender, but that might be inappropriate. That's definitely possible these days. I can't change my ethnicity and so forth, but there are attributes of that data set I can't change. So therefore, can I exercise control over it? Can I? Don't know. Second type, identity by doing or being. I actually express a huge amount of control over that. Massive, but we don't really most of the time because it's quite habitual, most of the stuff that we do. And so I think there's a really interesting thought process here around the thing I have the most control over, which is who I'm being in the world and what I'm doing in the world, is the thing that most people don't spend any time considering. <laughs> and the thing over which we have zero control or limited control, which is the way we describe our identity in the world, we spend a lot of time considering and debating and thinking through. I talked about that. It only is being, doing, and described. And I kept thinking about this when we put the presentation together and thinking about the question about the data ecosystem and New Zealand's future and our economy and all those sort of broader questions and my business too. And kept thinking, you know what? Maybe we actually don't need to know that it's John or Marjorie or Frederica. We just need to know what they're interested in what they're doing, who they're being, in order for us to be really, really proficient and really efficient at delivering value to them. Maybe that's the construct of future business. And the only time I need to let you know who I am as described is when it's in my interests. Like when I want to borrow some money from the bank, for example. But even, would it help you to know that the person I was talking to was a bank before who told me the least important thing about their customers is their name? which of course they would know, right? Because banks pretty much know most things about your life. But anyway, thought being, who are, you, who are you being as described, being as doing, and being as being in the world? And I thought, well, this leads me to the last bit, which is back to me and who I am. And by the way, there's a spelling mistake on the slide, so see if you can spot it. That's what happens when you get artists to put work together for you. Um, but this is really interesting, right? Because through the lens of who I, just, who I am by description, who I am by being, who I am by doing, the bit that's, not, the bit that's still missing from all of that, and the bit that I think is kind of interesting, uh, also another lens to look through this with, is I'm not one thing. I'm not. Most human beings are multidimensional. How many people in here have a Facebook account? How many people in here who have got a Facebook about account post everything about themselves on the world? I know some people do. God bless them. But for people like me, all my friends who live around the world think I live in a country where it never rains. <laughs> my children are happy skipping on the beach. My dog is running freely. You know, every day they think that's what life is like. You know, 
When I go to work, I'm on the back of a ferry and the sun is setting and it's beautiful because I've created a perception. It's not my identity, it's just a perception of my identity through one lens. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be seen as the guy there. I want to be perceived as badass guy. I'm not sure that's going to happen, given my Facebook statuses and my photos of my kids and my dog. But it's interesting when you consider that all the stuff we've talked about so far is a data-driven view of who you are as identity, started with the attributes that you were given, the way that you were being, the things you were doing, and how that's inferred in the world by just, by just existing. How that then is wrapped up with all the other people in the universe or in the planet and all the other things that we're connected to in our daily lives. And through all of that, we're only seeing a slice of it. Because we, as individuals, fundamentally have control over the perception of it. I've gr- I was this morning before I came here, I was talking to our Lab360 analytics team because they're having their uh, quarterly get, you know, team get-together. And we were talking about something very similar to this conversation um, and some of the challenges they see looking at the data. Because their problem is all the data is disconnected. They have to infer behavior by what information they currently have available to them because there is no identity. They don't know how to go and unravel all of that. It's simply bought some petrol, bought some milk, went to this place, does it four times a week, blah, blah, blah. Thin, narrow slice, oh, 57,000 people look like that. Not particularly useful when it comes down to identity. So we have control over who me is. So in conclusion, in the beginning, there is nothing. Who we are as defined by description is something that we have no control over and it's given to us, largely. Our identity by being or doing is linked to the events that happen to us, the things that we do and the way we quantify ourselves, the relationships we have with other people. And that's just me. And then there's all of you. And when we add all of you together, we then have to consider that we can infer relationships, behaviors, and identity from that. Identified by group, identified by name, identified by geography, identified by location, <laughs> identified by interests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of them represent you. The only person who represents you is you. And you have full control over the perception that is created about you. So on that note, famous quote. I'll give $10 to so anyone who can tell me who the person who said this. And this is the one thing that inspires me about all this talk about data and identity. Because it's all about what happened. It's not about what's going to happen. It's all about what happened. All the dimensions of identity that we've spoken about today, certainly in my presentation, even in Sandy's presentation, was all about what happened. How I was described, what I've been doing, who I'm being, who I'm associated with, what I'm connected to, da, da, da. it's all historic, right? It's all rear view mirror stuff. Because we actually yet, I don't know, unless anyone's figured out how to crystal ball or anything, or got a few bit of potion stuff going on that can predict the future, it's all about what happened. And I believe that people can choose to become or be whatever they want. And nothing is more entertaining than confusing a data analyst than changing your behavior. Thank you.